your feet and worship the Lord with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it.
this is the day. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. One more time, this is. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm especially glad that you're here. So grateful to be able to welcome all of you to the St. Paul's Baptist Church, and especially to welcome to the pulpit of the St. Paul's Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, who has come, who I know has a word from God that's going to bless us. And so I say again to you, let's worship God. Let's honor God's presence in our midst. Welcome to the St. Paul's Baptist Church, where we delight in everyone God sends. Good morning. Let us pray. Father, here we are, giving you praise and thanksgiving for another Women's Day at St. Paul's Baptist Church. We invite you, Father, into this place with us. We know that without you, there is no worship, there is no praise. And so we say thank you, Father, for being able to come and for those who are watching for being there as well. We ask, Father, that something that happens today whether through a song or a scripture or the preached word, that something will touch our hearts and give us food for our continuing journey. We know, Father, that if we are open to your will, in whatever expression that is, that you will be here with us. And so we say thank you. We give you praise, glory, and honor for being with us in this worship experience at St. Paul's. Amen. Gaffney, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 2 through 10. God says, at an acceptable time have I hearkened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the acceptable time. Ooh. See, now is the day of salvation. In no way none are we giving cause for offense, so there will be no reproach against ministry. Rather, in every way have we commended ourselves as servants to God. Through much endurance and tribulations and distress and calamities, five and, oh, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumultuous, in labors, in sleepless nights, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in holiness of spirit, in love without persistence, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Amid honor and dishonor, amid slander and reown, as deceitful and yet genuine, as unknown and yet well punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Stand with me again. We're going to sing this morning's hymn. 
Pass me not, O gentle Savior.
Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Baptist Church. On behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Leslie D. Callahan and our church leadership, I welcome you to St. Paul's where we delight in everyone God sends. Whether this is your first time or your first time in a long time, please know that you are welcome. My name is Caritha Mitchell and I use she, her pronouns. I am a member of St. Paul's Baptist Church and I am in what I like to call the land of moving madness, moving from Columbus, Ohio to Massachusetts. And despite all of these transitions, it is assuring to know that I have a home at St. Paul's Baptist Church. So I welcome you to join in this Women's Day celebration be all that God made you to be, whether it's in the chat, whether it's dancing around your living room, whether it is in the sanctuary in Philadelphia. We welcome you and ask that you be everything God made you to be because God delights in you. Now, we would love to be a blessing to you far beyond just this one service, whether you're watching it live or later on. We want to be a blessing beyond this moment. So please know that you can always reach out to our pastor at pastor at 1000wallace.org. That's the email address. Again, pastor at 1000wallace.org. Or you can reach our pastor by calling 215-989-9616. Again, that's 215-989-9616. 9616. Again, welcome to St. Paul's Baptist Church, where we delight in everyone God sends. St. Paul's members, please save the date. Mark your calendars for Wednesday, June 28th at 7 p.m. You are strongly to encouraged to attend a congregational meeting on our Zoom platform. Meeting ID 781-848-459. Please make every effort to attend. Church family, I regret to inform you of the passing of Deacon Eric Eady, 
which occurred on Saturday, June 17, 2023. Funeral services will be held tomorrow, June 26, 2023, at 10 o'clock in the morning, with a viewing beginning at 9 o'clock. Please keep the entire Edie family, particularly Deacon Charlotte Edie, in prayer. Good morning, St. Paul's. It is my distinct honor and pleasure this morning to introduce to you the 2023 recipient of the Ida B. Garnett Award. Deacon Ida B. Garnett was the first woman to be ordained as a deacon at St. Paul's. And in 2010, this award was named in her honor and is given every year to a woman trailblazer in our community. This year's recipient is Dr. Melanie Price. Dr. Price is former chair of the Board of Trustees at St. Paul's. She is also former director of Vacation Bible School at St. Paul's, and she was committed to the day-to-day -day work of making our community uh, more secure and securing our foundations for the work we hope to do in community for years to come. And then she was called away to her alma mater, Prairie View A&M University, down in Prairie View, Texas, right outside her hometown of Houston, Texas, in 2019, she became endowed professor of political science and principal investigator of the Mellon African American Studies Initiative, a $2 million initiative to establish an African American Studies major uh, and other programs there at Prairie View. And this fall, Dr. Price will be the Anschutz Distinguished Fellow at Princeton University. As you can see, she is incredibly impressive as a scholar, thinker, professor, and administrator. And she is also author of two books, Dreaming Blackness and The Race Whisperer, that think about black, black political behavior and black politics. She is incredibly smart and she is incredibly committed, but she is more than all of that, a committed member of her family and a wonderful friend. She is the youngest of Sandra Price's six children. She is twin sister to Dr. Melinda Price, and she is auntie to many nephews and nieces, both in her family and in her family of chosen and extended kin around the country. She is also my best friend, and she is truly a wonderful friend. Beyond that, she is the most hilarious person I have ever met. And if you have ever had to sit in church next to Melanie Price, all I'm going to say to y'all is don't do it. Do not do it. Uh, there is all kinds of inappropriate holiness going on uh, whenever you find yourself seated next to Melanie Price. But the most important thing I could say about Melanie is that she is committed to the cause of Black people and Black institutions. She loves us and her life's work, her work as a scholar, her work as an administrator, her work as a community leader is all about making sure that Black children and Black young people have the absolute best of opportunities and that Black institutions have what they need in order to live and thrive for many generations to come. I can think of no better recipient of the Ida B. Garnett Award than our own Dr. Melanie Price. Salute, Melanie. Congratulations. We are so proud of you. Good morning, St. Paul's. Good morning, St. Paul. We just wanted to wish Dr. Melanie Price uh, a congratulations for being the Ida B. Garnett Woman of the Year. Love you. And Melanie still loves St. Paul so much, so this is going to be a blessing and warm her heart. Thank you all very much for doing this. Hope to see you soon. Congratulations, Melanie, on being honored this Women's Day. On behalf of the St. Paul's Trustee Ministry, we thank you for your years of support and service. You served several years at a very difficult time as chair of the trustee board. And we know that it was a difficult decision for you to decide to go to Texas to take advantage of a very good opportunity. Even though you have continued to support us, both the church and the trustee ministry, and we are very grateful for that support. We know that we are constantly in your prayers as you are in ours. And I just wanted to let you know 
that your two years roll off period is over. So we look we look forward to you taking advantage of having a more uh, integral role in the ministry in the future. We thank you and we bless you. God bless you. Hey, Mella, um, congratulations on your honor. You deserve every honor coming your way, all of the accolades, everything. You're just a really phenomenal human being. And I'm proud to know you, proud to be able to call you a friend and proud to celebrate you today. It is my honor to join my congratulations to the chorus of those already being lifted for our own Dr. Melanie T. Price, the well-deserved recipient of the 2023 Ida B. Garnett Award presented on Women's Day to women who are trailblazers in the church and or the wider community. Trailblazers, those who whether by intention, circumstance or sense of call pave new pathways through wild country. I'm sure she's reminding everybody that Houston is not wild country but one of the largest cities in the United States. Yes, Mella, we know, the home of Barbara Jordan and Beyonce. And yet, like trailblazers, she too has pressed and pushed and plowed through wild country in ways that have not only led her to new places, but also leaves the path clearer and more resourced for those that follow. I remember one of the first times we hung out together for an extended period of time while she was still visiting St. Paul's. We were canvassing the neighborhood to make sure the community was registered to vote. It was a Saturday afternoon where she demonstrated a faith and care ethic that made clear that the difference between her and some of the people that we stopped was opportunity, was information or understanding, not worthiness or capacity. And by the way, she is one of the funniest people you will ever meet. And so we laughed a lot. But this is who she is in her brilliance, in her intellectual prowess, in her compassion, in her pastoral tendencies. I said pastoral, Mella, not pastor. That she leads and she teaches and carves out new ways for others to see, to learn, to live, and to become. Though we were a bit heartbroken when she, in 2019, returned to her alma mater, we knew that she had important work to do and we were not wrong. And we are the ones we have been waiting for, Alice Walker writes, looking about at the wreck and ruin of America, which all our forced, unpaid labor over five centuries was unable to avert, we cannot help wanting our people who have suffered so grievously and held the faith so long to at last experience lives of freedom, lives of joy. And so those of us chosen by life to blaze different trails than the ones forced on our ancestors have explored the known universe in search of that which brings the most peace, self-acceptance and liberation. This quote reminds me of Melanie her expertise and her heart for and toward our people in ways that create new ways of possibility for us all. She's indeed a trailblazer. Congratulations, Melanie Price. There's so much I could say about Melanie Price who epitomizes what this award is intended to celebrate. She is a trailblazing academic. She's a faithful member of our community and of this congregation. She's a person who brings her best. As a scholar and administrator, she clears new ground. As a church member, she showed up ready and able to work. When she led Vacation Bible School, she emphasized the well being of the children. As a trustee, she emphasized competence. And when she became chair, she reminded the trustees to pray before they counted. Anyone who knows Melanie knows that her greatest leadership happens when she offers advice and conversation where no one else is listening. She is a heckler, but even her heckling is a sign that she's paying attention. She's beloved by the youngest and the eldest and all in between. She is simply one of God's best. Thank you, Melanie, for all you do and for who you are. Bella and I love you, and it is my privilege to be your pastor 
and to extend our congratulations today. Hi, I'm Tamika Isley. And I'm Tamira Isley. And we would like to take this time to congratulate Dr. Melanie Price on your dedication, hard work, love, and support, as well as your unwavering commitment and excellence you give to the St. Paul's Baptist Church. This recognition is a testament to your talent and passion, and it is our honor to know someone so deserving. Keep reaching for the stars. We're all so proud of you. It is our pleasure to announce the 2023 Ida B. Garnett Trailblazer Award to Dr. Melanie Price. We love you. Congratulations. Good morning, St. Paul's family. I can't think of a better group of people who I love and respect more to get an award from. I was surprised, I was touched, I was honored, and I am so thankful that while I spent time with you and in the intervening years, we have been able to be a church family together. Thank you so much. giving time. Amen. We have three ways that you are able to give. You can go on the website at www.1000wallace.org and press the giving link. You can also give through our cash app, which is dollar sign St. Paul's Baptist Church. And lastly, you can give through the mail with a check or a money order. Mail that to St. Paul's Baptist Church at 1000 Wallace Street, Philadelphia, PA 19123, Attention Trustee Ministry. Uh, today is Women's Day and our assessment is $100 for women and $25 for children. So uh, please make sure you do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your continued support of St. Paul's Baptist Church and its ministries.
Good morning, St. Paul's. I'm Joan Collier, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's guest preacher, the Reverend Judy Fentress Williams, PhD. Judy Fentress Williams is in bivocational ministry in Alexandria, Virginia, as a professor of Old Testament at Virginia Theological Seminary and the senior assistant to the pastor for teaching and preaching at the Alpha Street Baptist Church. Dr. Fentress Williams received her PhD in Hebrew Bible from Yale University in 1999. She earned her MDiv from Yale Divinity School and her AB in English from Princeton University with certificates in African American Studies and American Studies. Prior to her appointment at Virginia Theological Seminary in 2002, she was a member of the faculty at Hartford Seminary as a professor of Hebrew Bible. There, she was also the director of the Black Ministries Program, a certificate program designed to meet the needs of African American clergy and laity in the greater Hartford area. Today, the Reverend Dr. Fentress Williams lives at the intersection of the church and the academy. In addition to her tenured teaching position at Virginia Theological Seminary, she works with the Christian Life Institute, ministers and in training programs, and teaches Bible study at Alfred Street Baptist Church, where I know her from the OTOG series that she does. Dr. Fentress Williams' published work reflects her interest in a literary approach that highlights the multiple voices in scripture. She recently published a commentary on the Book of Ruth for Abingdon Old Testament Commentary Series and was a contributor and Old Testament editor for the CEB Women's Bible. Her book entitled Holy Imagination, A Literary Guide to the Bible was published in March 2021. She is a member of the Society for Biblical Literature and serves on the advisory board for Religious Life at Princeton University. Judy is married to Kevin Williams, MD, and they are the proud parents of Samantha and Jacob. I'd be remiss not to say that she's also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, so she clearly makes brilliant decisions with her life. Welcome and welcome. Amen. Amen. Oh, you need to press a button. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. It is a joy to be with you all today on this Women's Day. Thank you for the invitation, and I want to extend a special thanks to Reverend Dr. Leslie Callahan for the invitation. Your pastor is someone for whom I have had great admiration for some time, and I was so glad when I finally got to meet her, and I am glad to call her friend. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Our text for this morning is actually the lectionary reading for today, which is Genesis chapter 21, verses, verses 8 to 21. I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and if you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Genesis 21, beginning with verse 8. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, was playing with her son Isaac. And so, so she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for her, the son of this slave, shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to do, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, a, a skin of water, 
and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her back, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about a distance of a bow shot, for she said, do not let me look upon the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. As you take your seats, will you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you that it is your desire that we come into closer relationship with you. And so our prayer this morning simply is that you will meet our needs. Move through me, Lord, so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, St. Paul's, we don't know each other very well. So I hope that what I tell you next will not cause you to judge me too much. Please try not to be too judgmental when I tell you that I enjoy reality TV. I watch all the housewives. You know, the real housewives of fill in the blank. And whether it's Atlanta or New York City or Potomac or Beverly Hills or Miami or Dubai, one of the things you will learn is that the Real Housewives don't do housework. I don't know why they call it that, because ain't nobody working, right? What they do is they take trips. They have parties and events. They, they, they get dressed up and go to fabulous places. So even if you've only seen one episode, what you will discover is when these friends get together in their fancy clothes, that all the issues that are underneath the surface are going to erupt. Sooner or later, when they get together, there's going to be a fight, right? And this is a formula used by these reality show producers. The women get all fancied up and dressed up, and they go somewhere, and then just wait for it, right? Somebody's going to say something, or somebody's going to show up that another person doesn't like. And then the looks are exchanged. Then the words. And the next thing you know, don't put your hand in my face. Drinks flying, tables flipping, all the tears and carrying on until the next episode where it starts all over again. So now if you've never seen The New Housewives, you don't have to. I've told you everything you need to know. <laughs> don't judge me. But sometimes after having to deal with foolishness all day, it feels good to watch somebody else. The producers do this. They put them all together. No matter how lovely the location, no matter who they're wearing, what designer it is, in defiance of this elaborate hair and makeup, rivalries from the past and present, ambitions, hurt, disappointments, they will act out on each other. Just like Genesis 21. Just like Genesis 21, right? We have a blow up at a party that ends up with an exile. Now, in order to fully understand what's happening in the real housewives of the ancient Near East, you need to have a little bit of the backstory. 
You need to know what happened in the previous episodes. You need to know who the characters were. And it turns out that it all starts in chapter 12 when God calls this man named Abram. God told Abram, go from your land, from your, from your birthplace, from your father's house to the place that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. A great nation. From the moment that God whispered those words into Abraham's ear, that promise did something to Abraham. He became a man who was torn between his current situation and the promise of God. Think about it. He lived with the pain of his reality in face of what God told him he was going to be. Do you know what it's like? To know that God has something great for you, but there's no greatness around you? Do you know what it's like to know that you are more than what your current situation says you are? That God has called you to something amazing, but you're surrounded by obstacles and shortcomings and naysayers and disappointments and people who think you are worth nothing. And if you know what that's like, then you know what it is to be Abraham. Abraham wanted to believe in the promise of God, but he just couldn't see it. He couldn't see it, so, so he tried a few things. He said to God, why don't we make Eleazar my heir? He's here, he's a good guy. I can see him, right? We could, we could fix this right now. And God said, no, that's not what I had in mind. God says that to us all the time. Then he and Sarah decided, well, we've got another plan. We can use our position and our power to force Hagar into the role of concubine and produce heir. It's completely legal. It's socially acceptable, and we have the means and wherewithal to do it. So they did. Now, Hagar, unlike Sarah, was not infertile, so she got pregnant which is what Sarah said she wanted. That's what she said she wanted, right? But as soon as Hagar became pregnant, the family dynamics changed. The Bible says that Sarah was lowered in Hagar's esteem. I think Hagar gave Sarah the side eye. You know that look you can give, that children learn to give when they have something that you want? that. She gave her an eye. And Sarah wasn't going to have it. And so the Bible says she was harsh to Hagar, and this pregnant Hagar ran into the wilderness out of desperation. And out of desperation, Hagar had an encounter with the angel of God and a promise. Don't miss it. The promise is that you will have a son named Ishmael, and Ishmael means God hears. God will make of him a great nation, but you got to go back. We don't like that part. Hagar had to go back. She returned and gave birth to Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn son, Abraham's legitimate heir. And then there's the plot twist. After all these years, then Sarah's going to turn up pregnant and has a son, Isaac. And from that moment, Ishmael's entire story in Genesis takes place in the shadow of a baby who was born. So now we come to our episode in chapter 21, where we're having a big party for Isaac's birthday, or when Isaac was weaned. He was probably about two, possibly three. All right? It was a huge deal because not all babies made it to that age. And this is a way of celebrating this child is safely launched into the world and everything's going great until Sarah, who we hope is satisfied but is not, sees something. It's not clear what she sees. The text says that she sees Ishmael playing with Isaac. She saw Ishmael 
doing something with Isaac. She saw Ishmael laughing. Now stay with me because the word for laughter is the same as the name for Isaac. Isaac means laughter. So essentially, Sarah saw Ishmael Isaac King Isaac. Right? What was the boy doing? It may be that he was laughing at Isaac or laughing with Isaac, or playing with Isaac, or teasing Isaac, or acting like Isaac. It's not clear what she saw, but what she perceived was a threat. It doesn't matter whether or not your little boy knocking on the door because you think that's where your siblings are. You are perceived as a threat. Ishmael is perceived as a threat. And think about it for a minute. Abraham is old. If he were to die soon, Isaac's just a baby. Ishmael is a young adult, firstborn, rightful heir. So as soon as Sarah accepts the lie that there is only room in God's promise for one person, As soon as she begins to tell herself that God only has this much blessing, Hagar and her son have got to go. Sarah demands that they be sent away, and Abraham complies, complies, and God allows it. Now stay with me for a second, because I understand Sarah. Sarah's filled with ambition and insecurity. That's a dangerous combination in any human being. I understand why Sarah did what she did. I actually kind of understand why Abraham did what he did, because Abraham's done some crazy stuff before. Abraham, when he gets under pressure, says, well, she's actually my sister. Um, So we know Abraham, under pressure, might just fold. I understand Sarah. I acknowledge Abraham, but why would God allow it? It's one thing when people are jacked up. We've all gotten to see that. But what happens when we see something crazy and it appears that God allows it? So look at what God says in the story. God says, don't be distressed about Ishmael and Hagar. Do go along with Sarah because I am going to make this son of this slave into a great nation. What God is saying to Abraham and what God is saying to us is don't be distracted by what Sarah's doing. Don't let Karen determine what your day is going to be like. She's issuing orders, and she's making demands, and she's carrying on, and she's actually overturning the law that says Abraham must take care of Hagar. She does all of that. But God's word reminds us that she's still not in charge. God said, I'm making a promise to Ishmael. His future is secure. That suggests to me that if God has a promise over your life, if God has made a covenant with you, that all of the naysayers and people who show up and try to put up barriers may think they're in charge. But don't be distracted by them if God has promised you something. That's a me and God thing that has absolutely nothing to do with anybody else. So even though the narrator sets up this thing like it's coming from Sarah, God shows up to say to Abram, don't worry, this is all a part of my plan. And when we understand where God is in a situation, the thing that we think is an exile, the thing that we think is expulsion, the thing that feels like rejection may actually be your exodus. Your exodus. Stay with me. Hear that word exodus. You know the story of the exodus. Moses 
Let my people go. Pharaoh says, I will not let my people go. I do not know your God. Back and forth, back and forth. Moses and Pharaoh and Miriam and Zipporah and the midwives and all of these women who were doing the work of liberation until God moved and the sea divided and the people walked through on dry land into freedom on the other side. And then Miriam said, let's sing, y'all. It's pretty spectacular, but it's not the first time God made a way out. It's not the first exodus. Before the exodus, God made a way for crazy Jacob when his brother was trying to kill him. Before the exodus, God made a way for the dreamer Joseph whose brothers were out to get him. Before the exodus, God made an ex a way out for Tamar in Genesis 38 when she needed an heir and couldn't find one. And in Genesis 12, God made a way out for Sarah when she was in Pharaoh's court. And again in chapter 20, when she was in somebody else's court. And in 21, God made a way out for Hagar and Ishmael. Hear me, because we get distracted because sometimes we think our exodus has to sound like that one narrative. Some of our exits come in disguise. It doesn't look like it on the front. On the outside, it looks like you got fired. Or you got dumped. She said, I'm out. He said, I don't love you anymore. It might feel like you were expelled or lost or put away, and you may not know it in that moment, but you should be shouting because God is making a way out for you. This is your exodus. Some of us are being freed, and we won't know it till the end of the episode. It's only when we get to the end. When we get to the end, that we can look back and answer the question, why would God allow Hagar and Ishmael to be exiled? The answer is because that's not what God is doing. God wasn't allowing them to be exiled. God is orchestrating an exodus because God had a promise over that boy's life. So I want you to hear me this morning because this sermon may not be for everybody, but it is for anybody here who knows what it is to be Ishmael. If you're an Ishmael, firstborn, second class, this sermon is for you. Someone who's lived their entire life in somebody else's shadow. Somebody who's given lower status in a system they didn't create. Someone who's not called by their name, but the son of a slave woman. Someone who's not called the son of a patriarch, but a threat to Sarah's plan. You were the heir to the promise until Sarah and Isaac showed up claiming that they had right. Stepped over, misunderstood. They never got your name right. They clutch their purse when you come by. You are a dangerous, wild ass of a man without ever, they don't ever acknowledge the violence that they exercised over your mother to bring you into the world. But you're the threat. In that system, it's only a matter of time before you were exiled into the wilderness. If there's anyone here who's been exiled from what you had, exiled from the only thing you've known, I pray that you will learn to discern in the wilderness that the promise God had for you could never exist back there. God's blessing for you, Ishmael, is too big for that system that doesn't recognize your humanity. They can't handle the beauty of you. God had to make a way out. God had to get you out of there into the wilderness to show you, you are the boy who lived. Ishmael, God hears you. Don't be distracted by Isaac's inheritance. Don't let his rhetoric resonate in your ear. 
God promised your mama and told your daddy, you are a great nation. Now, maybe you are not Ishmael. Maybe you are Hagar. Look at what Hagar does in this story. When they ran out of the skin of water, I still have an issue with that, that Abraham gave them. They ran out of that one skin of water. It says she put her son away from her. And she went away because she said, I cannot look at my son die. But the Bible says she cried, but God heard the voice of the boy. The angel spoke to Hagar from heaven and said God heard the voice of the boy. She cried. She cried to God. God heard the voice of the boy. Hagar's response to no water was to put her son away from her. She cried. The Jewish Publication Society says she burst into tears. I want to suggest to you this morning that Hagar is behaving like someone who is preparing for the worst. And do you know why she's preparing for the worst? Because she's seen this before. Hagar's behavior is like that of someone who has experienced trauma. This is not her first trip into the wilderness. Her name is Hagar, Hagar, the sojourner, the stranger. She knows what it is to be on the mean streets of the ancient Near East. She has had enough. She has seen so much. All she can imagine is the worst thing, and she cannot see it again. So this is for all of our Hagars today. Don't let trauma limit your vision. Don't let what's happened to you in the past cripple your faith. This is for someone who knows what it is to be in the wilderness. You've been there before. You have exilic moments every day. And the last time things were complicated in this family and became too hard, she had to flee into the wilderness and she was pregnant. And here she is again. Pushed from a system where your value is tied to your ability to oppress an oppressive system. You're only as good as what you bring to a system that has no love for you. Your only value is in what you produce, what you provide, how you serve, and when we're done and we've used you up, we'll get another one that looks just like you. They do not understand who you are, Hagar. They're terrified by your beauty and your strength. They have meetings about what to do about your hair. They want to control you. They want to squeeze you all the while. They are secretly envious of who you are. Hear me, Hagar, who has seen one too many wildernesses. God is making a way for you. God wants to transform this wilderness into your sanctuary, but you have to open your eyes and see the well. Listen to the text. The text does not say God created a well. The well was there all along. It said God opened her eyes. When you are trained to look for the worst thing, you have to teach yourself how to hope for the best thing. It never occurred to her to think, yes, I'm in the wilderness again, but last time I was here, God showed up. So what if I move through this wilderness hoping this time that God might just show up? Don't give up, Hagar. Don't give up, woman who is a stranger. Let God open your eyes so that you can see a way through. God made a way out for Ishmael. God made a way through for Hagar. But the thing about God's redemptive work is that God doesn't just redeem the people we like in the story. God's redemptive work is for all of us, even Sarah. Sarah 
the matriarch, who appears to have so much on the surface, is shaped by her own wilderness. All those years of infertility have made her someone who is insatiable and never satisfied. Hagar will tell you about it. People who grow up food insecure become food hoarders. People who have never had money act crazy when they get it. And Sarah, when she finally gets a child, can't be generous and enjoying the blessings of God. She never learned how to trust. She's not sure that God has enough because for so long she felt like she didn't. Now hold on, before we go too far in shaking our heads about Sarah, I should mention that somebody who grew up as a Hagar can have Sarah tendencies, right? So you get a checking account with a positive balance. You get a couple of letters behind your name and all of a sudden you find yourself like Sarah becoming a gatekeeper deciding who can and cannot enjoy God's blessings. Who deserves the forgiveness of God? Who gets to sit inside the sanctuary? So if you're not careful, you will find that you too somehow begin to think God doesn't have enough because it took you so long to get it. You think there's not enough. So if you've been a Sarah or if you have a little Sarah in you, you have to reframe the narrative and stop just telling the story of how you suffered, but tell the story about how God provided. Tell the story about how it didn't come the way you wanted and it didn't come when you wanted and you certainly had moments when you weren't sure and it's actually hard to hold on to it. But when God blessed you, when God blesses us, sometimes that blessing just breaks us open. Think about this for a minute. This woman's child is named Isaac. His name is Laughter, all right? Laughter will bust you open. A good laugh makes you throw. I'm not talking about a tea or a little polite giggle. That's not the child's name. Child's name ain't giggle. It's not tee hee. It's laughter. And when God blesses you sometimes in the right way, something will break open inside of you and say, I can't be dignified today because God's been that good to me. Remember the moment, church, when God did that for you, remember that moment. Don't remember all the struggle and striving that led up to it and forget the moment of breakthrough. Don't forget that when you look back over your life, you get to tell the story about how God broke that thing open. And I will sing of the goodness of God. And there's enough for everybody. The God that did this for me will do it for you. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I didn't get it because I'm holier than anybody in here. But God gave me a big, fat blessing. And I'm going to laugh every time I think about it. This God of Abraham is reminding us even when we are in exile, even when we are in exile because we, like Ishmael, are beautiful and strong, but struggling because we're trying to fit into someone else's blessing. Hear what God says. There is a promise over your life, and this exile is your way out. It is your exit ramp to a better way. When we find ourselves like Sarah, who appear to have so much, but deep down inside, we are a terrified child. Go back and remember the place where God feels that it has clouded our vision. Open your eyes. There's a well right there. There's something there you didn't make that God has for you. And it is more than enough, not just to keep you alive, but so you can have an abundant life. This day, saints, let God take your exile and turn it into an exodus.
Amen. Amen. What a blessing it has been to hear the word of the Lord as it was brought to us by the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. What a blessing it is that Ariella got to hear that sermon as the first sermon she heard at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. Hello, Ariella. Welcome. And now we have the opportunity to respond to the word of life. Now, I know already that it's going to take a minute for you to reorient yourself. Because you've been telling the story one way. You've been telling the story. In fact, you, you're right now in that wilderness and you're like, ain't no water here. Let me just get ready to die. It's going to take a minute for you to reorient your thinking. It's not a one-shot deal. It's, it's not, most, for most of us, it's not instantaneous. But what we can do in this moment is to offer ourselves to God and say, God, if, if this is really not exile but exodus, I wish you'd let me know. If this really is, it, it may be a rejection of these systems that are not designed for us in the first place, and I'm good with that. But if this really isn't a rejection from you, but a way out of no way, let me know. I wonder, will you signal your openness to a revision of your perspective? An opportunity to see life anew. Reverend Jackie is going to come and pray. And again, after the prayer, if you go home and you're like, ah, I still feel bad. Eh, I still feel like fighting. Eh, throw the whole thing away. Remember, you're just leaving a, just leaving a little opening, just a wee bit of room. For God to transform your perspective so that you'll know that you are heard, so that you'll know that you are seen, so that you know that the thing that has been most painful for you, God can turn it into a place where you burst forth with laughter. Just leave open that slight possibility as we pray. God, we believe. Help our unbelief. God, we want to believe. Help our unbelief. God, we want everything that was preached to us to be true this morning, but help our unbelief. God, we want to reframe. God, we want to stop letting trauma cloud our vision. God, we want to stop believing that there isn't enough for us, God, we want to stop feeling like we aren't enough, that when people call us by the wrong name, they are actually correct. God, we want to believe. Help our unbelief come by right now. Whether we are in this church house or watching online, whether we are pulling this up years from now, God, touch us, stop us right now, help us to believe. We call forward now that little crack, that little crack, that little opening in our hearts, dear God, that we have truly been seeking, but we are too afraid to ask for God. Just flood us with it right now. Have your way with us right now, even if we are being stubborn, even if we are being gatekeepers, even if we have accepted narratives that aren't true, even if we are holding tight to our trauma, God, just crack that window open for us. Because there's somebody here, and when I say here, I mean at any point in time, there is somebody who feels like the trauma is bigger than you are. God, show up. 
There's somebody here who feels like the identity that they've been given is bigger by the world, is bigger than what you have given them, but God, we need you to show up. There is somebody here right now who feels like they are not able to see anything beyond their trauma, that they will never be better than it, that they will never be beyond it. But God, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus for freeing that person in this place. The word that she brought today is a statement of faith, one that we are going to choose to believe. So God, help our unbelief. Help our unbelief, even though we know you are able to heal us. God, we need a healing. We stand in the need of a healing. God, come by and heal us, Lord. Help our unbelief. God, we need you to comfort our grief. We need you to carry us through this pain. We need you to show us where the water is time and time again. Some of us need it every single day. God, won't you do it for us? I know you showed me yesterday, God, but will you show me the water again today? God, we need to hear from you. We need you to mend broken relationships. We need you to show us how we can be in a space like Sarah and Hagar and Abraham. God, we need you to show us how we can be siblings like Isaac and Ishmael. God, we need you to show us how we can have our pain not cloud our engagement with one another. God, we need you to free us right now. The word that was brought forth, God, we recognize as a word of liberation, as a statement that we will be free that we can be free, that you want us to be free, that we're called to be free. God, free us now. Thank you for the reminder that you have spoken a promise to us. Thank you for the reminder that you have indeed spoken a promise to each and every one of us. God, thank you for the reminder that even if we can't remember what it is, even if we can't piece the words together, that you have indeed called us to something, you have spoken something over us, that we are your divine children and that we have something coming. God, we thank you for that reminder. Help us just a little bit to walk that way. Help us to talk that way just a little bit. Help us to live that way just a little bit, day by day. God, we believe. Won't you now help our unbelief? Won't you now help our unbelief? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hasn't it been good for us to be here? Let me try it again. Hasn't it been good for us to be here? I certainly can speak for myself. It's good. It's been good for me to be here. Thank you so much for all of you who have come out to service this morning. Thank you to the choir and to the musicians and to the ushers. Thank God for the deacons and the trustees. Thank God for Bella. And thank God for our preacher, the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. It's time for the benediction. There are some light refreshments downstairs following the benediction. And I invite you to enjoy them with us um, as we prepare to go. And I pray, as I said during the invitation, I pray that that space that you're making for the possibility that God might be at work that God will show up in that space. God has a way of doing that. That God will show up in that space and make God's self known to you. I'm praying that for myself. And I'm praying that for us all. 
Reverend Judy, you want to say anything else? You're done saying things? She's done saying things. Hasn't she been a blessing to us today, though? We can't wait for you to come back. Her daughter is here. Samantha, welcome. We're so glad for all of you. You all heard me say, Ariella is here. I think she's gone out to have something to eat. Yes. Um, Minister Brendan is here and his wife, Gina. Ariella is what, six weeks old? Six weeks old. Um, we praise God for her. We praise God for all of you whom we see this morning, some folks we haven't seen in a while. We praise God for those of you who are watching online. Your presence is a blessing as well. Joan is sitting in the back. She's clapping for the people who are watching online because that's usually her. And we're glad for her. We're glad for her and for everyone watching online. All right, now receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and power of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today, tomorrow, and forever. Let the church say amen. Amen. Go, Go in, in peace. peace.